family values. We uh, kicked off this series last week talking about how we as a family, the first value that we were going to unpack is that we want to be gospel obsessed. We just, I just want us to be a people who have this lens of the gospel on, whether we're looking at our own life, our own circumstances in front of us, whether we're looking about the track record or train wreck of mistakes that we've made in our past, or whether we're just looking out at the other people that we're interacting with at the soccer field or the people that we run into at Starbucks, the people that we go to school with, whoever it is, I just want us to be a people who have this lens of the gospel on our eyes at all times. Like I wanna be obsessed with it. Remember the, the definition of being obsessed is, is a bit like the state of being obsessed with someone was that first definition that was super lame. But the real one was just, the, it's like, I can't get it off my mind. It's something that just keeps on coming up. And I just, I want us to keep in mind that God created everything and it was good. That we have all participated in rebellion against his good, right ordering of the world. But praise God, he has made a way in Jesus for us to be redeemed and for us to have relationship with him. And in that now, we are not just waiting for heaven someday, but we are now partners with the spirit of God to bring renewal into the world that we're living in. We are gospel obsessed. That, I just want you to, like, to have that in your bones. This week, what we're moving on to is we're moving on to the value that we're family. We're family. This is, this is one of the values where I just got to let you know, um, as some of the new people have come over the last couple of years, this is something that just, it comes through easily in this church. And I, I don't know for whatever reason that is, I think it's in large part because of how Kent just kind of wired that into us for so many years that we are just, we're family. We're family people. That is who we are. The, the church is, is so much more like a family than it is a business. Yes, it has business aspects to it. Yes, we have this building, but more than all of those things, we're a family. We're a family. And so, like, I just consistently hear where people come into this place or they visit it on the first time or they're vi- coming back after being, not being here for like maybe 10, 20 years. And they just go, man, it just, you hear words like, it felt like home. Like, man, I just, it felt just, I felt like family instantly. I just felt like I belonged. I felt like people actually wanted to talk to me and wanted to engage with me. And it just so warms my heart that that's something that has somehow just woven its way into the fiber of who we are as a church. However, remember the point of doing this series is not that we would just have a set of behaviors that we now kind of rigidly adhere to, but that we as a people would be continually transformed, that we'd be called all the more into these values so that we can just continue to embody them in an even greater way. So we want to actually be, we want to grow in our capacity. This is what I said last week. We want to grow in our capacity to be the people who we say we are. And so man, the first couple values here, this one that we're going to unpack this week is the fact that we as the church, we as Good Shepherd Church, we value and we love being a family. It is no secret that at this point, the, the de-evolution of the family unit in America is, is staggering to watch. It is staggering to watch the unraveling of the nuclear family as a core value of our nation. Really, I mean, it is, it is almost in this windfall just changed overnight. I was reading some stats this week where uh, um, grandparents raising their grandkids is one of the fastest growing demographics of parents right now in our nation. It's a fascinating thing. The birth rate right now is, is continuing to drop, which is always a sign anthropologically that, that a culture or a people don't have a huge sense of hope if their birth rate is declining. So birth rate's declining. The amount of uh, babies born into single mother households, that number is continuing to go up. You, you just think all of these, the divorce rate is astronomical. There, there are so many people, there are so many different blended families. And I don't want for even a second to think that like that's a lesser version of family because it's not. But I think we would all acknowledge The man that to get to the point of being in a blended family, even though God can do beautiful, wonderful, redeeming things in that situation, man, there's probably a lot of pain involved to get to that point, wasn't there? A lot of heartache, a lot of of difficulty. And I don't think it's just the the stats there. Those are easy stats to read. But the things that you can't really measure are, are what we've all just felt with family over the last couple years. Gosh, like... COVID has been so weird in so many ways, but one of the ways that it's been so painful is the division it's created in families. Like I, I, I just, I've talked to so many people where it's like, well, I wasn't vaccinated, so I couldn't even visit grandma who was passing away. Uh, there, there's just all these different things where, where all of a sudden now family gatherings are divided between these people chose this route, these people chose these route, and we're not really blending or mixing in any sort of way. The political hostility that, that bloomed from all of it too, 
where I just think we as a people, we got so just tense and so just kind of like angsty over the last couple of years that man, just even the way that you voted, the way you approached this issue, where you thought about this issue, it just felt like it all kind of came to a head, not just at the office place, not just, uh, not just with like your coworkers that you see every day or not just with friends that you would interact with, but where it really just came to a head was like around the Thanksgiving table, wasn't it? And we always make that joke where it's like, oh, you know, don't bring up politics around Thanksgiving. But now it's like, don't you dare. <laughs> no, 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 don't say anything. Because that like, there is, we can joke about it. We can laugh about it. But there's a great deal of pain behind what I'm saying right now. I know it. I, I know it just from interacting with different people, different stories, listening to different conversations, uh, knowing what's going on in this church. I know that there is a great deal of pain behind what I'm saying right now. Where you see that the, the family even though in a lot of ways it's changing in America what a family looks like. And there's a lot of ways where God's doing beautiful, wonderful, awesome things in different looking families. And I'm all for that, of course. But I just also know that when marriages end, it's hard. When, when kids are in foster care, it's hard. When, when blended families are coming together, man, it, it looks good a lot of days, but there are some days where it's probably just really, really, really difficult. Like the point... I think because at a, at a deep psychological level, we all uh, have this deep core need to belong somewhere, that that immediately makes human relationship within family fragile. It makes it delicate. It makes it hard. Uh, we all have these romanticized, perfect picture idea of what family would look like. But when, when push comes to shove, when like the rubber meets the road, it is really hard to live those out and to see those things happening perfectly anywhere. I, any perfect families in the room, let's just maybe... But here's, here's what we can take heart in. Is the Bible full of dysfunctional families? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I, I thought about just like, maybe we just would go a little fly overview of Genesis this morning. We would just kind of go page by page through Genesis just to look at all the jacked up families in there. <laughs> Man, you think your family's jacked up? Why don't you go talk to like, I mean, let's just start Cain and Abel. <laughs> Cain killed his brother. I know you've been mad at your brother before, right? But he literally, he buried that dude in the dirt. Let me go past that. You have Noah. Noah, it's like, man, there's all this wickedness around Noah that God has to flood the whole earth, which I, I mean, that's a whole story, right? In and of itself. But then afterwards you have, you have Noah's sons like, like, like walking in on him after a drunken stupor where he felt, he passed out naked and they exposed, I mean, it's just like, oh my gosh, can you imagine these things happening? You go to like Abraham and Sarah, and then you have Hagar, H Hagar, Ishmael, like what is going on in this whole situation? You have Lot who has all these, I mean, if you read the story of what happens to Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah, it's horrific, isn't it? I'm not even, like, I would, I'm not even gonna say it here on stage because I see some little faces in the room. Go read it on your own. You'll, you'll be like, my family ain't so bad anymore. You know what I mean? I mean, you go, you, the way Genesis ends. I mean, there's all the stuff, there's, there's Rachel, Leah, all these crazy stories in between. Then you get to Jacob. You get to, uh, or I'm sorry, Joseph. Joseph, yeah, man, you have such significant family issues where this father so loves this one son that he causes the, re the jealousy in the rest of the sons to rise up to such a level where they're like, man, let's kill him. And then one of them gets this great idea. Now let's know, we're not gonna kill him. We could make money off of him if we sold him into slavery instead. <laughs> uh, that's, this family dysfunction is not just all throughout the Bible. And like your Bible, I think it's intentional that the book of Genesis starts with, um, if you think back to Daniel Grothy when he was here, I loved how he mentioned how like uh, losing stability was one of the first curses of the fall. I've never, I never had really thought about it that way, but like one of the first curses of the fall for Adam and Eve were placelessness, right? Where all of a sudden they had a place to call home, but then they were cast out from there. But then immediately after that, what do you see? You see the consequences of sin manifesting themselves in the family with Cain and Abel. And it just goes on and on and on and on and on. All throughout time, families are broken. Here's the good news of the morning right now. Families are broken. Mine has some brokenness in it. Yours has some brokenness in it. Yours maybe looks a different way than mine does. Uh, mine maybe looks a little better than yours on Sundays, but all of us know exactly what it feels like to have family around us that we love, that we care about, that is filled with strife, pain, confusion, frustration. You name it, it's all there. It's all there. But here's the beauty about what God wants to do. So last week we talked about that we are gospel obsessed. We're gospel obsessed. 
That, that if we, remember what I said, is if you have this definition of the gospel in your mind, where you define it solely based on what happens to you when you're saved, it's not that you're wrong, you're right. That is what, like, we can marvel at what God has done for us personally, but the broad lens of the gospel would cause us to consider there's way more going on than just our personal salvation when it comes to the gospel. And one of the first implications of the gospel is that God puts us into a family. So here we see it in Ephesians chapter two. Ephesians chapter two, Paul has just done this masterpiece at explaining the gospel. I I referenced it quickly last week, that you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but God has made us alive together in Christ. This was not your own doing. This was his grace, his work alone that saved us. Right after he establishes that beachhead, he goes right in this point. He says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of two. Now, specifically, what Paul is talking about right now is he's talking about the the division that happened between the Jews and the Gentiles, God's chosen people and the rest of the world. Now, if you, if you think that we, were, we are divisive in, in current modern America in 2022, like I, th- I think it would be good to know, man, uh, probably what would even rival and make us look like we were all buddy, buddy and best friends with Republicans and Democrats would be going back to look at like the Pharisees and the rest of the Jews or the Jews and the Gentiles. Or, or I mean, you just go, they were so kind of like just lumped together in their people groups and they had so much then judgment towards other people groups. And Paul writes in and says, he's like, he's like, no, hey, church in Ephesus, like Christ has broken down the dividing wall. He has, he's gone where there used to be two kinds of people and he's now making one. He's now making one. Jews and Gentiles, like he's reconciling them together. It says, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who once were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, pay attention to this verse right here. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens of the saints and members of the household of God. You're no longer strangers, no longer aliens. You are now fellow citizens and saints and members of the family members of the household of God. God through the church intends to refamily the world. God through the church intends to refamily the world. Like, so absolutely. One of the reasons I, I love getting so excited about the missions conference is because it just reminds me, it should remind all of us, that the body of Christ is way bigger than what's happening in Loveland, Colorado. Like there are gigantic moves of God happening all around the world. And if we don't pay attention to that, we're, liable to get dis- we're likely to get discouraged based on what's just happening in America right now. But if we can lift our eyes up and see what God is doing all over, that we have this family that goes all over the world. Like Marcel, Mar- that, that dude's my brother. His skin tone and mine, very different. But that guy is my brother from another mother. You know what I mean? Like we're family. We're part of the family. But even more, more distilled than that, the local church is a household of faith. You were made to belong in a household of faith. God's plan for your flourishing, for my flourishing, is for us to belong in a church somewhere. I, I felt the need really just to kind of pause on this first point here, just to kind of anchor a couple things for a lot of us in the room. I have, I've talked to so many people who have found their way to this church over the last couple of years. And, and really you're coming from a church where the situation was extremely unhealthy. Like, I'll, I'll just call it what it is. You were, either, you were either overused as a volunteer. You were either let go off of staff. Your, your church family had drifted off values that you once thought were, were central and now they're doing something different. And so you had no choice but to leave. Church hurt is a very distinct and painful kind of hurt. Uh, and I, I'm not saying that from personal experience. I'm saying, I'm saying that from what I've seen and some people that I love dearly. And for whatever reason, there are a lot of you finding your way here after experiencing some significant church hurt. But let me just remind you, it was people that failed you. It was people that hurt you. It wasn't Jesus. Jesus is perfect. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And he is building one thing on this earth right now, and that's his church, his kingdom through his church. That's the vehicle that he's building his kingdom. 
And so I'm, I'm sorry what happened to you happened to you. I genuinely am. If I could sit down and share coffee with you, I would just say, I'm sorry you went through what you had to go through. But I would hope that they're really, when people get offended by a church, really one of two things happens. You can see it happen over and over again. They choose to drift from the Bible. They drift from Jesus and they end up drifting from the faith altogether. Or they hold closely to what scripture says. They hold closely to who Jesus is. And even though it may take some time, they find themselves back in a church community, in a church body, where they can once again begin to heal and grow and flourish into who God has them to be. And so I'd hope that even though something has happened to you that has caused offense, that you won't choose offense going forward and that you would continue to choose, nope, I'm gonna stay gospel obsessed. I'm gonna stay focused on who Jesus is. And even though it might be hard to give myself over to a new church family, I believe that's exactly what the New Testament would bid us to do if we're gonna hold fast to scripture. People are always like, well, where's the verse that says, as soon as I get saved, I should join a church. I'll just tell you honestly right now, there isn't one. There isn't one. But what we do see are verses like this all throughout the New Testament that say, man, here's the gospel. Here's what God has done. And with that, he's made you members of the household, members of the family. Even amongst all of our dysfunction, distrust, disunity, what God intends to do through his church is to refamily the world through local expressions of his house all over, all over. And our family doesn't look like Foundations family or Grace Community family or City Point family or Rez's family. But, but praise God, there are families all over this town where people can join. Amen? And so here's, here's my, make this, I make this invitation all the time. This may not be the church for you. And I hope it is. I hope you can find yourself planted here. But if this isn't the church for you, man, it is more important to me that you find one that you can plant yourself in than it is that you would just keep showing up here. Root yourself somewhere because God through the church wants to flourish your soul, wants to flourish your soul. Ephesians keeps on going. It says, um, you are now house, citizens of citizens with the saints, members of the household of faith. He keeps going to say, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself, himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place, place for God by the Spirit. I, I just, I love this. It's, it's the Father, Son, Holy Spirit working in tandem. And the, again, Trinity isn't a word that shows up in your New Testament either, but we see it played out in this verse right here. The, the temple of the Lord, in him, you are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit the way that we are going to overcome the dysfunction that we all have as humans is by acknowledging that it's by Jesus's blood and Jesus's grace alone. That's the only qualifier of why we're here right now. That's the only qualifier. And the more that we focus on that, the more it forces us into a place of humility. See, because we can't steer to a place of perfection because we know that's not attainable for any of us. Instead, we have to lean on Christ's redemption for us. So the first point is that God is going to refamily through refamily the world through his local church. The second point is that all are invited into God's family of redemption. Everybody is invited into God's family of redemption, Jew, Gentile alike. Does, like this message has gone forth so that all might join, all might come in. I, I, I so long to be a church, to continue to be a church. Let me say it that way, where we would welcome anybody who finds their way into these doors. I don't care what they look like, what they smell like. I don't care how they're dressed. If they're dressed not according to their gender, I hope that we would be a place that welcomes people with open arms because I was reminded this week, it's not our job to be the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit changes people. Do we change people? No, we think we do though, don't we? We honestly, this is what well, I was challenged. This, I was challenged with this this week. We, we think we're better at changing people than the Holy Spirit is. And I just think we'd be far better off leaving that to him who's been doing it for the last couple thousand years than us try to do that in our own power. I, I listened to this message, the whole, the whole uh, Next Gen team, there were seven of us, we all went down to the Colorado Springs this week for a conference, really just to hopefully grow in our ability to execute family ministry here at Good Shepherd. Because it's not just about the church being a family, like we wanna, really be, we wanna be really good at equipping and resourcing and inspiring families to be, to be good parents and to be good grandparents. Like we wanna do family ministry well. And while we were down there, um, Pastor Brady, who's one of our overseers, and he was telling the story of, man, how do we as the church, how do we be a, a warm and welcoming environment while not necessarily affirming and agreeing with everything that's being taught out there? Uh, can we agree? That's a, that's a delicate balance, isn't it? So he says one Sunday morning, he's, uh, he's 
just finds himself in the hallway and he's over by the kids' check-in table and in walks a, a lesbian couple with seven kids. He's like, oh my gosh, look at all these kids, right? I, okay, I want you to picture yourself in that moment and how you would react. Brady said, hey, can I show you around? Can I walk you to where you need to go? Thank you for being here. I'm so glad that you guys are here. Can I, what ages are your kids? Tell me their names. Can I hear a little bit about your story? In this quick little conversation, he immediately made someone feel welcome. And then he, he took it to the next step to say, hey, I just, I don't want you to be caught off guard. At some point, you're gonna hear from here, us that we, we teach the traditional view of sex and sexuality and gender. And we'll, we'll teach on that from time to time. But I want you to know that you are welcome here. I hope we can be a church family that handles those awkward situations that well. Or we can say, I, I, don't care, I don't care what you look like. I don't care what you dress like. I don't care how much money it appears you make or that you haven't made in years. You're welcome here. Come on in. Do you want to sit by me? Can I take you and go get you a cup of coffee? Can I show you where your kids need to be checked in? That warm and welcoming environment. Every single person on planet earth is invited into God's story of redemption. We have to keep that in mind. We have to keep that in mind as a church family. Romans 12. I love how Romans 12 says it this way. It says, for by, grace, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Let's just let that settle in our guts for just a second. Every single person, for by the grace given to Paul, he's encouraging us not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, but to think with sober judgment or a clear mind, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body, we have many members. So here's another verse that's just explaining what church membership needs to look like. For as one body, we have many members and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Not everyone's gift in this room looks the same. Like we, we all have these different gifts, but here's what we have to keep in mind. Every single person has been gifted in some way. There's nobody that gets to just sit on the sidelines in God's kingdom. Everyone has a role. Everyone has a gift. Everyone has something that you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, are going to excel at. You're going to be efficient at it. And even though it might be hard, you're going to see fruitfulness from it. Everyone has this. And so he goes on just to, to list a few. He says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If it's prophecy in proportion to our faith, if it's service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. I just, there's this encouragement that no matter what you're gifted in, the call is use it, use it. We have this line that we'll say from time to time where we cannot do all the ministry that God has given us to do unless everyone uses their gift accordingly. Like, man, this is not like the pastor show where we just do this ministry and we just kind of do this show for you to uh, be entertained on a Sunday morning. Rather, we are a family. And you know what happens in families? Yes, somebody's going to prepare the turkey at Thanksgiving, but someone else is going to cut the potatoes. Somebody else is going to do the dishes. Somebody else is going to clean up afterwards. Don't be the uncle who sits on the couch and asks for another beer during the football game. <laughs> oh, hey, what time's dinner? It's late. I'm hungry. Like, bro, what have you done all day? We have all these different gifts, all these different roles. And of course, it's going to look different. And, if, and, and, I, and I don't like when churches act like it all ports over perfectly to Sunday morning either. Or just say, oh my gosh, you are gifted in hospitality. Will you please be a greeter at the front door? Now, do we need greeters at the front door to make a hospitable environment on Sunday morning? Yeah, we do. But let's never for a second define your hospitality by the way that you smile at somebody while they walk into a church building that they were already planning on coming to. <laughs> do, you, do you see what I'm saying? But there's ministry to be done here that does require some help. There's, there's you want to hold babies, go hold babies. You want to teach elementary schoolers, teach elementary schoolers. You want to, you want to lead middle schoolers? Praise God for you. Help us lead some middle schoolers, right Taylor? Like, man, th like there are environments, there are spaces. You want to be a part of this prayer team so that you can sit with somebody and you can watch them cry and you can just listen and you can wait with them and you can beg the Holy Spirit to show up in their life. Man, join our prayer team. You know, like there are spaces all over to get involved. And there are also spaces out in the community that we have chosen to partner with prayerfully that would just be blessed by, by people and prayer and finances coming alongside of them. So 
We are all members of the household, gifted differently, but together we make up this one body. He keeps going to say this. He says, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. I just, I would ask you just to consider, what would that look like in your household? What would that look like in your family? Outdoing one another in showing honor. Just a fun thing to think about. Do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit and serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. The way that we treat and interact with one another is a witness to the world around us. It says so in John 13, Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another by this, your love for one another. All people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Outdo one another in showing honor. Keep loving, keep keep, keep trying to meet the needs of the saints around you. Sacrifice, give yourself up to show hospitality to other people around you. This is what a family does. This is what a church family should look like. As members of God's family, it's not just that everyone's invited in, even though that's true, but once we are part of the family, as members of the family, we're called to look distinctly to the world around us. First Peter, when he's writing his letter, Peter says this. He says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, here, listen to the refamiling happen right here. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So as a people, we are called to look distinct. We're called to look distinct, I think, in really two basic ways to walk in unity towards the brothers and sisters of the faith. So yeah, we may not look like that church. We may not look like that church, but man, we have unity with one another. We're we're charitable towards one another, even if we don't land on the exact same things theologically. We have this unity, even in the household, even in this house right here, we have a certain level of unity. I know if you were to just go around and pull everyone on some like separate issues, we don't line up on the same stuff perfectly all over. Some people think church is just like, it's this cookie cutter Christian that looks exactly like this. And I know how you vote. I know how much you make. I know your household. I know your backstory. And it's like, that, that is not true at all. But what we do have in common is Jesus. And Jesus, his cross, his blood, it's big enough for us to walk in unity towards one another. Even if we agree on 50, 60, 70% of the other overarching stuff, we can come in here and we can agree because Jesus is that awesome. So we have unity, but we also have holiness, at least a serious pursuit of holiness. If we're going to be members of the household of faith, we have to recognize we're a peculiar people. We're not going to cool our way into God's kingdom. We're not going to just be such a cool church that everyone just wants to come. They're like, man, I want to be as cool as those guys. No, we're going to have to have a distinct set of behaviors, a distinct set of ethics, a distinct way of acting while we're living in this world. And all of that needs to be this Holy Spirit-filled, grace-driven effort so that we might press into more of God, who God has called us to be. So the way we handle our money, the way we handle our time, the way that we treat sex, the way that we, I mean, you just go down the line. Christians should look distinct. The easy adage is we are in the world, but we're not of it. I, I may live in this world. I may shop at the same Home Depot as you. I may go to the same school that your kids go to but I don't think and act the same way as every other person who walks in that space. And we know that and we embrace it and we live courageously in the moment. So we look different. The fourth thing is that God longs for your involvement in your church family. Some of the early data is starting to come out from COVID and what it's done specifically to church attendance. I'm not coming after anybody right now personally, but I am just reminding all of us as a church family, Really what what COVID has done, one of the things we're seeing in church attendance is it's taken whatever your clip was of regular attendance pre-COVID and you shift it down one to two times per month. That's just the nationwide average of what's happening with church attendance right now. So if you were four times a month, I'm there early, I'm there every time, you're now more like three times a month on average, maybe two times a month. 
If you were two times a month, now you're once every like six weeks, right? And so that's like, I think COVID, it did a lot of, again, did a lot of weird things. One of the things it did was it showed us, man, watching church on YouTube is just pretty darn convenient. It just way, it's way easier to just dial in for 35, 40 minutes. I watch things on two times speed. So really I'm, I'm done in like 15, 20 minutes. And I'm like, boom, done. <laughs> Don't let the convenience replace the necessity of belonging in a church family. God's plan is for you to flourish belonging to a local church. Now, membership, it might be way too formal for you. You might think it's way too antiquated or outdated. But really what membership looks like in the New Testament church all over the place are people who are giving their time, their talents, and their treasures to a local church body. Again, if that's not this one, I'm, I'm just begging you today as a pastor, go find one. Go find one you can root yourself in, plant yourself in. But as we belong in a church community, what's going to happen is we're going to all of a sudden have brothers and sisters that we can walk through life with. Man, life, call it what you want. Life just gets heavy sometimes. Life gets hard and we need brothers and sisters who can, who can lean on each other, pray for each other. Like you need this family. Don't, don't neglect the gathering is what the author of Hebrews says. Don't neglect this getting together, getting, getting face to face with someone, showing up in person, getting to know somebody's story, getting to know somebody's life, what's happening. I love that our church is, is intergenerational. That's that like God longs for your involvement in church family. That's just not true for just the adults in the room. I, I just like, I love like Caleb Sayers, how old are you, bro? 19, eight, 17, I was way off. Dude, 17 playing the keys like this. We'll have kids running this. Hayes, you're a kid. Come on, man. You're like, Hayes, we have, we'll, have, we'll have middle schoolers serving the elementary schoolers. We'll have, we'll have young adults serving the high school. We'll have people who are still in elementary school going and serving pre-K. Man, come on. So, like there are kids serving coffee to you sometimes. And that's not just this like, man, we need to make sure we have some young faces up in the place, you know, to make sure we look young to the rest of the world. No, it's because there's no junior version of the Holy Spirit. Like God's growing all of us. So there's no saint too old, no saint too young to get involved in your church family. How do you get involved? Time, talent, treasure. You spend time here. You show up when we're doing uh, encounter nights. You, you lean in, you engage. You don't just show up and be present. You actually, you actually come expectant, come ready, come hungry for what God might do. You, you come with a sense of like, okay, God, what do you want to do? You, 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 you are a member by, by, your, by your talents. So whatever God, whatever grace gift God has given you with, use it somewhere. Encourage somebody, serve somebody, be generous to somebody, lift somebody up. Use your gift of administration to help us put things in order around here all sorts of different kinds of gifts. And then, man, uh, your treasure. Like historically, that's that the church has been ran off of saints giving their tithe, giving their first fruit offering to their local church body to see to it that all the ministry that's gonna happen there can continue to happen well. We'll talk about generosity more in a couple weeks. But before we do that, we're gonna end by receiving communion together. So if you grabbed a cup on your way in, good job. Plus 10 points for you. If you didn't get a cup, just raise your hand. And we got them coming down the aisle way. I'm gonna bring Katie up here with me. For whatever reason, I, just the way that even our church is structured looks like family. And I don't, I don't, I don't envision and see myself doing this as like a single dad. You know, I'm thankful for a co-laborer and somebody who helps here. I'm thankful for the team that that pours into this place all the time. This is not a solo effort. Like I'm not just some dad trying to do this thing that I have no idea how to do. Like it's a it's a family from the top down. We're focused on Jesus first and foremost. It's his church, it belongs to him. But then even from that, like I'm just thankful for co-laborers. And I thought that even as we do communion together, once we're done doing communion, I thought that um, we'd have this mother figure of the house come just lead us in the Lord's prayer and come lead us in just uh, praying a blessing over all of you. So if you would just stand with me. So God, we just lift up these elements to you and we take the bread, God. God, we do this in remembrance of your broken body for us. That you gave yourself us for us so that we might be saved, so that we might be forgiven. And God, we receive your body today as the gift of our salvation. And God, we take the juice now, recognizing 
the blood of the new covenant that you've ushered in by spilling your blood on the cross. We're reminded that it's by your stripes we are healed. And so if we ask for your healing in our church family today. We ask for your grace to compel us and to fill us all the more, Jesus. And with that, we receive your grace today. Would you read uh, the Lord's Prayer with me? You can put it on the screen. Jesus said, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Would you just hold out your hands as I pray a blessing over you? God, I'm thankful for every single person in this household of faith. God, I just pray a blessing over them. I pray that you would speak to them. God, that you would commune with them, that you'd be leading and guiding them. We pray that all of us, whether we're young or old or new to the faith or mature in the faith, um, married or single, God, that we would all grow in the knowledge of your will, that we would grow in spiritual understanding, that we would be able to experience your love in new ways, God. We pray for marriages in this place. God, for those that are married, Lord, we pray a blessing on them. We pray that those households would be um, places of refuge and of peace and of joy. Would we outdo one another in love? God, we just, we pray a special blessing, God, on marriages in this room. We pray for those that are single. God, we pray a blessing on them. We pray, Lord, that you would um, help them to, to steward that gift as well. We know that uh, a lot of kingdom work can be done through those that are single. And so we just ask, Lord, that they would take every opportunity to serve you with complete devotion. We pray for those that have lost a spouse, God, that you would comfort them, that you would give them strength and joy in the midst of their sorrow. We pray for those that want to be married. God, we just stand with them and we ask, Lord, for the desire of their heart. We pray that in your perfect timing, you would bring the right person into their life and bring them together. God, we pray for the children and the youth of our church. God, would you ignite a fire in them? Would you ignite hearts that are passionate in love for you? Would they be exa an example to us in faith and love and purity? We pray for a passion and a zeal that no circumstance or hardship or power or influence would be able to put out. Raise up the next generation to love you and follow you and lead them in the paths of righteousness. We pray for the elderly in our congregation, God. I just pray that they would resist the temptation to phone in their relationship with you, that they would not just ride on the, on the uh, waves of years past, God, but that they would press in to new uh, depths of your love, new depths of relationship with you. We pray for parents, God, that you would um, lead and guide, whether it's grandparents raising grandkids or blended families or foster and adoptive families. We ask, Lord, for your Holy Spirit's help to parent the children that you've entrusted to us, whether they're grown or they're young. Thank you that it's not up to us to do it perfectly, but it's uh, your Holy Spirit's job to call them and to woo them to yourself. 
give us the wisdom to know how to do that well, how to uh, put them in an environment that your Holy Spirit can move. I felt like I got a word um, maybe for some families or individuals in the room. Um, Treacherous waters. And I just, I, I was asking the Lord, God, is it, are you just going to say, peace, be still, and the, the storm's going to go? But really what I felt was um, the, just the phrase, lighten the load. And I saw this picture of casting cargo over, over the edge of a boat. And so maybe your family is in treacherous waters. Maybe you individually are in a really hard, scary storm. And I'm praying that God reveals whatever that might be to to get rid of what's unnecessary, to get rid of the excess so that you can make it. And so God, I pray for the people that are in that spot. I pray, God, that you, um, even though the storm might not just go away, God, that means you have something for them in this storm. You have character that you're building. You have trust that you're building. You have eternal rewards in store for them. Would you give them wisdom on what that means to lighten the load so that they can make it through this storm? God, thank you for each member of this household. Continue to lead us and guide us in your ways, in the ways everlasting pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Um, Here, let's put up the family slide real quick, Hayes. We're about seven minutes over, and that's my fault, and I'm sorry, but I'm not apologizing. Um, (laughs) We believe church is more than an organization that you attend. It is a family to which you belong. Our family makes room for the outsider, and anyone can belong here. We're brothers and sisters of a spiritual family where holiness is sought and unity is a blessing. We know we are a peculiar people who have a distinct language and behaviors. There is no junior version of the Holy Spirit. Our family is intergenerational. Everyone plays a role. We honor the past and we champion the future. We cannot do all the ministry God is calling us to do without all the members of our family playing a role. There is nothing like the church, and so we give our whole lives to the family. We root our lives here and walk with each other through thick and thin. We are a family living lives on mission for our city and our world. And the church said, amen.